So I am showing 10 a.m. Eastern time right now. So we can go ahead and get started. So hello and thank you everyone for attending our virtual town hall, Spotted Lanternfly Management Strategies and the latest updates. And so this webinar is being co-hosted by Rainbow Ecoscience and Society of Municipal Arborists. We have a really exciting lineup of speakers here to talk to you today. And I'm excited to introduce them to you later on. But before we dive into the talks, I just want to go ahead and get started off with a safety brief. And so one of our core values at Rainbow Ecoscience is safety. So before we begin, we always complete a quick safety brief to remind ourselves of our safety protocols, even in this virtual world right now. So please check your surroundings for any trip hazards such as cords or bags. And we have attendees from all over the country and really all over the world as we just saw. So please be aware of any inclement weather in your area. That's what Eric and I were just talking about some of the storms that are coming through the Midwest. So be aware of that. Uh, make sure that you have a plan for it if you um, inclement weather were to hit. And if you are in your vehicle, please make sure you're parked in a safe location. So to start things off, uh, on November 1st, 2021, and in case you haven't known, Rainbow Tree Care Scientific Advancements announced that it has changed its name's name to Rainbow Ecoscience. Our new name reflects the company's purpose that started in our boriculture and now includes products and protocols that encompass the entire green industry. We started our research and development division in 1997 with just two products that protected trees from deadly diseases. We saw a need to invest in practical research that produced predictable results, something that was lacking in the tree care industry at the time. Today, we bring that same innovation to landscape maintenance professionals, municipal foresters, electric utilities, nursery and greenhouse growers, government land managers, and many other green markets. The new Rainbow Ecoscience name expresses our dedication to the care of the entire urban ecosystems. And additionally, I uh, wanted to give a shout out to our co-sponsors uh, for this webinar, Society of Municipal Arborists. And if you're not aware of the organization, they were founded in 1964. And this is really an organization for municipal arborists and urban foresters throughout the world. And the mission of this organization is to build the competence and camaraderie of professionals who manage trees and forests to create and sustain more livable communities. And if you are interested in obtaining some more information about this, you can learn more at www.urban-forestry.com. It's a really great organization. I encourage all of you to take a look at that. So to start things off today, just wanna to give an introduction to myself. My name is Eric Lindbergh. I'm our lead technical advisor at Rainbow Ecoscience. And so a couple of things that I work with is uh, on EAB management plan development. So Emerald Ash Borer. I also do a lot of kind of training and education on plant healthcare protocols, such as today with Spotted Lanternfly, answering technical questions and providing support for our products and equipment. Uh, I got a bachelor's from UW-Eau Claire over in Wisconsin in ecology and environmental biology. And I have a master's from Texas Tech University in biology with an emphasis on forest ecology. And additionally today, um, someone we're gonna have on in the background, she might show her face a couple of times, but we have Allison Harrell. She is an arborologist over on our West Coast in Oregon. Uh, she is, uh, She's a great resource for any sort of training and education on plant healthcare product protocols. She answers a variety of technical questions and uh, travels kind of all throughout the West Coast helping people with their plant healthcare protocols. She's got a bachelor's in biology from Valparaiso University, and she's got a master's from in environmental science in urban forestry and applied ecology from Indiana University. Additionally, she is ISA certified arborist and she is track certified. So, uh, so yeah, just a housekeeping slide. Um, if you have any questions during the webinar, please type those into the Q&A box using your control panel, and we'll answer those at the end of the talk. We are recording this webinar and it will be available afterwards. So you'll receive an email with a link to view it. Finally, this webinar is worth 5.25 ISA CEUs. So if you did not enter or you don't remember if you entered your ISA certification number and during registration, 
you can go ahead and type that into the Q&A box right now, and we'll make sure that you get your CEUs. Um, again, with that, make sure you put that into the Q&A box. That's going to be the best way that we can track that information. So today's agenda, we have, uh, like I said, a wide variety of talks. Um, like I said, for right now, we're just in the welcome period with myself. Uh, next, we're going to have a talk on spotted lanternfly biology, life cycle, and distribution with Dr. Eric Day. And I will go over with uh, everyone's bios uh, right before the talk. At 10.55, we'll have a regulatory update with new populations, quarantines, pesticide restrictions, and federal and state efforts for control from Paul Kurtz with the New Jersey Department of Agriculture. And then we're going to go ahead and have a 10-minute break. And again, all these times are in Eastern time zone as well. So after that break, we will have a talk on research and management strategies, some of the pros and cons of different application techniques, and that will be done by Mark Ware. Then we'll have another 10-minute break before we go ahead and jump into our panel. And this is going to be around unique learning experiences around contracting and implementation of SLF management strategies. And we have a variety of people that are going to be participating in that panel. We have Pete Benz, Greg Parra, Katie Balecki, Matt Travis, as well as David Anderson. So with this, uh, this is going to be, you know, a, a kind of a full half day of lots of exciting talks. So hopefully everyone has their coffee. And with that, it is my pleasure to introduce Eric Day, who's going to be talking about spotted lanternfly biology, life cycle, and distribution. Uh, Eric Day is a faculty member in the entomology department at Virginia Tech. He is manager of the Insect ID Lab located on the main campus in Blacksburg, Virginia. This lab handles over a thousand samples per year from all over the state. And samples are from public, private, and commercial clients, and samples can include mites and insects on vegetables, turf, fruit, trees, and ornamentals, greenhouses, household and recreational areas, and livestock. So a wide variety there. Uh, Dr. Eric Day specializes in insect identification and invasive pest surveys and has authored numerous Virginia Cooperative Extension publications. Thank you for participating in this talk today, Eric, and I will go ahead and hand over the screen. Okay, thank you very much, Eric. Thank you for the honorary doctorate there. So um, <laughs> real, real pleasure to be involved here again with Rainbow and, and uh, continuing involvement and also a chance for me to kind of give an update on spotted lanternfly. Uh, I am, I love talking about spotted lanternfly. It seems like what I do a lot of. Um, I'm banned at family gatherings from talking about spotted lanternfly, so it's nice to get an invite to come and talk here. So um, I was even updating the slides this morning. I think that's one of the themes that we have with spotted lanternfly. It's a moving target. Um, Real quick, Eric, uh, do you wanna hit share screen? Okay, um, I'll, all right, so. Sorry, I'll sorry. Do that. Good, <laughs> so it's a moving target and we get, um, it's a lot of updates on it. So with that, I will start sharing screen. Okay, can everybody see this? Uh, get a thumbs up, good, very good. So as I was saying before, it's, it's a moving target. Um, we are constantly changing um, uh, what we're doing, what we're writing in our presentations and our maps, et cetera. And so uh, try to get as updated as, uh, update as close to what's going on as possible. I think uh, definitely I see some good speakers here coming up after me. And I think that'll be a, a reoccurring theme. We'll try to get you updated as close as we can. But I will kind of develop, delve deeply into the, the um, basic biology and, and what we know on it so far. So kind of first start with the distribution um, of this insect. So uh, this is probably a map that regulatory officials don't like to see. So I was working on this yesterday. So I just kind of look at it by a state view um, and I'll get into the more county view here coming up more nuanced view of it. So spotted lanternfly, this is a national timeline, first detected in 2014 in Pennsylvania, uh, southeastern Pennsylvania, 
Um, no new state records until 2018 when Virginia, Maryland, Delaware, and New Jersey all popped up on the map with detections. 2019, West Virginia added into the club, Club Lake Horma. Um, 2020, addition of Ohio, New York, Connecticut, and then 2021, Indiana. So if we look at the map from Cornell here uh, that is updated, the most recent update I could find was March 28th. So that's about right, although there are some counties missing from Virginia. I'll talk about that coming up here too. It kind of has two kinds of aspects to it. But this is as they are reported by state regulatory officials. So there's a little bit of lag time there in that regard. So um, I think always you need to go to the source if you want to find out what the most recent thing is for your particular state. Um, and I'll show you here what we've got most recently for Virginia. So again, a Virginia centric um, presentation uh, and just kind of that's what, what we're living in right now. This is our what we call our stoplight map um, for Virginia. So red, orange, yellow. Um, and, but you can see the red, those are the high population quarantine areas in Virginia. Um, the other counties have smaller kind of spottier kinds of distributions there too. So it's a little different than the national map, but and again, these are things, there's a bit of lag time as far as when these things get put on. Where will it spread to? Um, and I'm always a little bit hesitant to put this slide into presentations only because people will say, wow, it's all the way out to the Midwest. No, this is just the potential spread. But I even see articles where and, and newspapers where they misinterpret this map. But um, this is the potential for spread based mostly on climatic conditions, um, although the climatic conditions um, uh, are also very good for Atlanta's Tree of Heaven which is one of its main hosts. And I'll talk about that kind of coming up later on there. But that is down the road where, we, where the potential is seen um, for the spread of this particular insect. So the phenology, um, and this is, comes from various sources, uh, and this has kind of been kind of essentially, I would say ground truth that we're working from USDA information on their prediction models. And I'll talk to you some links for that coming up too. But, we've been out there and looking and collecting and seeing things. And so these are kind of your, your basics on phenology, um, when to expect various life stages. And the key one that we um, rely on first will be egg hatch, which is approximately 200 growing degree days, base 50. Um, and this is about late April in most of Virginia, although I'll talk about kind of nuancing that a little bit too coming up. First adult is about 1120, 1120, 1120 growing degree days or about mid July. So that's when first adult occurs. And then first egg mass typically is about 3000 growing degree days. And that should kind of show up a little bit of a red flag there for folks because you have this two month gap essentially between when first adults when egg laying happens. And that's a lot of dispersal is occurring at that time, unfortunately. All right, so kind of backing up to winter time, where is it in winter? So mid-September to late April, you have egg masses, egg masses on tree trunks, egg masses on concrete, egg masses on rusty metal. Um, but mostly you're gonna find the egg masses on the host trees, particularly on um, the tree of heaven. But as we're seeing in Virginia, maple, it seems to be a very much favorite host. You see a lot of them there on maple. But when you uh, show the host list and the egg mass list, and you'll see that there's a lot of other trees that is laying eggs on. May not actually be a host feeding plant. Um, so there's a little bit of nuancing that has to be done on that regard too. But again, this is the winter condition, the egg masses. Also, if you're looking for them, scouting for them, you will find old egg masses that have, that have hatched. And so that's always to be kind of aware of and some that have the material weathered off. Also, at some point, these, the female spy lamplights will lay, lay egg masses, but not put the covering over. So uh, growing degree days at 200, we see egg hatch. And initially they're tenoral, uh, newly hatched ones have no coloration except for their eyes, but this, changes very quickly. So you can come across these in the morning and within a few hours, they will have their full dark color, um, black color, white spots. So if you come across egg masses, uh, you will see in, early on at first hatch, uh, again, 
late April ish, about 200 growing degree days, you will see these tenoral nymphs um, newly hatched. So, what's happening now from May and in May and June, um, you have development of the spotted lanternfly, the first three instars, uh, and these are black with white spots. Uh, they are less than a half inch long, best way to describe that. Um, first stage, about four millimeters uh, or three sixteenths of an inch. Um, second stage, about a quarter of an inch. Third stage, about three eighths of an inch long. Uh, they have this projection on the front of their head and that's where the mouth parts attach, um, piercing sucking mouth parts. And they are all very conspicuous looking uh, and they might say that's gonna be really easy to find in the field. They hop away very quickly. They move to the other side of a branch um, or a stem. So they're actually pretty easy to walk past, um, even though we think these are gonna be a really easy one. It's a pretty humbling experience to get out in the field and look for them, walk past them a couple of times before you actually can see them. Egg masses too, in the same way. So again, that behavior of hopping and jumping away also is a factor in dispersal. And I'll talk about that kind of coming up too. So this is the fourth instar. And at this point, still black with white spots, they develop a distinctive amount of red coloration to them, about five eighths of an inch in length. Uh, they can be solitary. They can also be clustered on branches and the like too. This is again in the, in the range of 200 degree days to 1,120 growing degree days. Uh, so again, hop away. It, they're easy to miss even at this stage too, um, but they will be dispersing. You also will find them on lots of different hosts at this point. Also called a fourth stage or fourth end star. All right, so when the adults are occurring, it's gonna be starting about 1,121 growing degree days or early July in Virginia uh, is when we have reached that time. So, and the adults will be present from that early July until the first really hard frost, light frost, don't seem to bother them too much, but you'll be seeing them dispersing, moving around. Initially, the females um, will be kind of um, skinny, I guess, um, but later on, as they start to develop the egg masses, um, they will have, the interstitial areas in their abdomen will show, and they'll see a bit of yellow coloration there, yellow bands on the abdomen. Uh, so the wings wingspan about an inch and a half, um, and the long siphoning mouth parts are held under the body. Um, and again, the yellow coloration is something you'll see kind of more towards late summer, again, as the egg masses are developing and the interstitial areas show. So, um, the sights and smells of summer. This is, you get to an infested area and um, first you notice the honeydew that has fallen down. If you're in an area um, with active spotted lanternfly population, it's kind of like a light rain. So kind of raise your hand, it's been pooped on by spotted lanternfly and that's what it is. Um, and so the, uh, and obviously sooty mold is gonna be a, a factor after this because this honeydew is an excellent growth medium for sooty mold. Another factor you see too is yeast development and fermentation. So underneath the trees, you get fermentation for the high amount of um, honeydew that's landing on the soil. Um, so you get a strong vinegar smell um, in these areas with very heavy infestations. So it's pretty obvious at this point what's going on. Those white patches on that bark, the top right one there, those are yeast. Um, colonies yeast growing. You also see it there in that middle one on the bottom too, yeast colonies growing on the ground and on the trunk. So first egg masses are about mid-September or about 3,000 growing degree days. Um, initially pretty, the fresh ones are a little shiny. So you see it looks like fresh putty. Eventually they kind of dry out, get a little duller look to them. Um, and it's not uncommon to see multiple egg masses in one location. Some Old, new egg masses over old egg masses uh, and various kinds of things going on. So it's, um, you see a lot of variation on the egg masses. Coloration uh, means that they are very hard to see, very similar to the bark coloration. Um, so they're again, an easy thing to miss, although you would think they would be something you could pick up on. Uh, they are cryptic as they get more weathered. Um, uh, they lose that uh, gray coloration. Gray coloration gets dried and cracked. 
Um, also, there's a certain percentage of eggs that are laid without the covering. So it tends to be kind of towards the end of the life cycle. Uh, the female apparently does, is not producing a fluid covering. And so you do see some bare eggs um, out there. They do seem to survive uh, too. So we do see them overwintering. We do see some normal hatch on those bare eggs. Uh, so, and um, so you see a little bit of variation on it. Most of these egg masses are about an inch and a half long, about a half inch wide, but you see sometimes they um, kind of have this sort of zigzag zag trailing pattern that will leave um, as they're, as they're laying, laying their eggs. So you get a bit of variation on that. You see these on twigs, um, stems, trunks, main branches, also um, non-plant material. So you do see them on um, things like Jersey barriers, concrete blocks, rusty metal, particularly gallon drums, sides of rail cars, et cetera. Uh, out of the forest, um, best place to look for them is look up in trees with branches, um, you know, that are kind of, you know, eight, five to eight inches in diameter are, are really good spots to find them. Um, I, I don't know what that is about those, but that's kind of in the field um, areas. You'd be looking for them. Um, and it, it doesn't, doesn't hurt to maybe bring a pair of binoculars out. You will see them from ground level all the way up to as high as you can see up in the tree, um, which is uh, another factor for them is that they're, they're just gonna be present throughout, throughout the whole canopy when you have high populations. Um, and when you're looking up into the sky um, and you got some bright light, bright sky contrasting with the trunk, it is fairly hard to see. Um, so again, um, let your eyes adjust or use binoculars or something, take a look for them. And, and it's a little, it takes a little time to kind of pick up on finding these spotted butterfly egg masses. Uh, everything, they, so the, everything nearby is a potential place for these things to lay their eggs. Uh, so that bottom the left one, that's a truck trailer. It's unfortunately an abandoned truck trailer, but this is kind of, we've seen them on actively, on construction trailers actively being used. Uh, so this is, um, as well as 55 gallon drums, fence posts, rocks, um, and we know all that about that story to um, all kinds of places to for them. All right, this is kind of a re recap of the life cycle. Um, right now, um, we are always see as an indication of only one generation per year, our uni bowl team for Virginia. So this is what we're, what we're kind of working with. Uh, we definitely have our eyes open in Virginia um, due to our some southern locations for spotted lanternfly that for look for a second generation, but no indication. So for one generation per year only, uni bowl team. Um, and this, our model, um, or our observations um, here uh, tie in very closely with the USDA model. Um, so this is uh, USDA and, and a single out, Greg Para have been just excellent as far as providing us information. Um, and I'll talk about some other researchers there too. So there's a lot of really good resources out there, a lot of good research going on with this. Um, but again, hatch in late April, first adults mid July, egg, egg laying about mid September. We have a fact sheet available. So again, Virginia centric, um, but I think that being kind of the southern edge of this um, infestation, uh, we maybe start to see kind of some, or having some unique perspectives um, or different perspectives than what are seen in more northern locations. So um, dispersal, uh, talk about biology and distribution. Um, dispersal is, is the main thing. I think like, unfortunately, that's not my first rodeo, but like other successful invasives, this one is very good at dispersing. Uh, and so there's kind of two ways that we see one, they do it and one that we do it. So what they do, they are, the nymphs will hop and jump from host plant to host plant. Uh, they will often be found on things like blades of grass or weeds or the like nearby that may not even be a host plant, but they're, they just seem to be on the move. They hop and jump off of trees, um, climb back up the tree, which is why the, the sticky band and and the circle traps, um, inverted funnel circle traps work very well because these things are constantly uh, off the tree and getting back up on the tree. Um, the adult spotted butterflies make repeated migratory flights depending on conditions and food sources. 
Uh, so that's uh, another factor for them is that they, adults are also on them. And in Virginia, we're seeing approximately 70 days between first observed adult, first observed egg masses, dispersal is occurring throughout this time. Uh, and they are just, just on the move. So a combination of nymph and adult, we're looking at probably three to four miles through walking, jumping, and flying uh, for, for the spotted lanternfly. And then us, usins. So um, dispersal through movement um, by humans. And so this is the top picture there. That is a rail car parked in a siding in Winchester, Virginia. Um, the trees behind it are heavily infested Alanthus tree of heaven. So this is the kind of another aspect of why uh, this has become a big pest and these are very good at dispersing. So they're on trees that are found predominantly on transportation corridors. So tree of heaven grows on disturbed soil sites. Um, and, and so by definition, those are going to be transportation corridors. And so this is, we're seeing them along railroads, highways, um, and field borders, but mostly railroads, highways, those kinds of places, we see tree of heaven very predominantly in Virginia. And so these are also where the, they're able to jump from this site, these sites, these trees, over to trucks, trains, et cetera, and then lay eggs there or hitch a ride just by being themselves. The nymphs can be transported, but they have a very high mortality rate. So that's probably not as likely of a method, but you do see them on products from time to time. The adults are the biggies. They show up on products um, inside trucks, all kinds of things. And uh, often we get reports of them. They show up dead on product that comes in a pallet load of something. So that is, you know, it's a regulatory incident, but that's not been a spread. Um, but the adults have been moved. Um, you drive out of a spot of landfly territory, you definitely want to check your vehicle, um, you know, roll up your windows um, when you're at a, at a site and so that, that you're not moving these things when you go. You see them hanging on your windshield wiper uh, as, you're, as you're driving away. Um, you have to check your cargo. So you look at your truck, pickup truck, you know, look in the back, make sure you don't have a spot of landflies back there. Transport a gravid female. Um, she can lay up to three egg masses once she gets on site. And I'll kind of circle back to Virginia map, and I think the other maps kind of show too that transportation corridors have been one of the main ways this, these insects have spread. And then once they're there, then they kind of spread on their own the three to four miles a year. Egg masses can be laid on anything. Quarantines are not to move spot lanterfly. A lot of it is geared towards um, the egg masses. It's very similar to what we dealt with with gypsy moth, the egg masses could also be transported, but they will lay their eggs, as I've already mentioned, plant material, um, uh, so nursery plants, logs, um, but then trucks, trucks carrying everything from pop bottle to concrete blocks can be conveyances. And if they're stopping for anything more than fuel or uh, traffic, uh, it's a pretty good idea to have an inspection. And some states will require that to have inspection if it's making a stop in an infested area. So again, I guess I may have said gypsy moth, but we the name has been changed as spongy moth, and that is kind of um, uh, kind of making a slow transition there on that. But that is that is the new official name for what we used to know as a gypsy moth. So conveyances um, and humans big factor for spotted lanternfly. This is the host list, um, and that as we know it in Virginia. So again, Virginia centric. I always like to rely on things I've seen. Um, although we'll touch on the literature here coming up real soon. Um, but right now, um, this information put together by Mark Sutphin, Doug Pfeiffer, and myself, um, uh, Teresa Dellinger, et cetera, we're, as far as what are the host lists where we have seen it in Virginia. And so and that's a pretty long list, um, but the test is not until tomorrow on it. So don't worry about that. Um, uh, so but no, really, no, no test. But just to kind of give you an idea that uh, I'm not trying to snow you with all these hosts here, but this has a very wide host range. Some of them are a little more preferred than others. And uh, so I, it's kind of, again, hard to, to kind of grasp here, but this is, so this is the ones in yellow are ones that um, we're seeing nymphs and feeding and this sorts of thing too. So um, of course, uh, 
things like um, Tree of Heaven um, are going to be uh, a major, major place for their feeding. They sow up a lot on grapes, of course, uh, on maple, particularly Norway and Freeman maple, um, which is a hybrid. We've been seeing them in very high populations and feeding on there too. Burdock, they seem to like burdock as a food source, river birch. So those are some of the big ones. The eggs are not always um, going to be a, a, a big fat, uh, you know, an indication of what's going on because the, it seems almost indiscriminate where they will lay their eggs. And we'll even see egg masses on white pine, which we know they don't feed on. So it's the egg masses um, are always kind of sort of think about that as like, is that really a, a nymphal feeding source? So again, kind of talking, coming back to something I mentioned earlier, we are always learning on this. I'm always changing the slides. If I, if I happen to reuse a similar this set of slides next week, I would have changes in it too. So it, it is a moving target as we go. All right, I just kind of touch on some of the work and, and I'm, I hope I'm not leaving anybody out and there's just a lot of people doing some really great work on this uh, with it. Um, Behringer um, et al, uh, worldwide host feeding plants um, reporting 172 different hosts worldwide what spotted lanternfly has been feeding on. So um, there's a reference there, which is certainly available on, online here too. Um, Kelly Hoover and her lab um, has been doing a lot of work on best on survival um, of spotted lanternfly on, on various hosts. So Atlantis altissima, tree of heaven, is its main preferred host. It will do okay on other hosts, um, including maple, but has a, has a reduced fitness, so it doesn't do as well. Um, kind of interestingly enough, um, Tracy Lesky, Laura Nixon, and their lab at USDA has shown often that mixed situations, so tree of heaven mixed in with other hosts, seem to be work uh, best for spotted lanternfly. Um, so again, we're kind of learning a lot as we go. Um, they will complete development on black walnut in addition to this one well, they see on spotted lanternfly. So again, multiple hosts tend to do a little bit better for them. Um, it's kind of the sort of the field observation we see. They are kind of returning a spot to tree of heaven in the late fall too. There's also some information particularly put out by Temple, um, Temple Lab. They have this dashboard. Um, I was just noticing that there were some changes on here this morning, so I was updating my slides on that. So again, um, if you want information about forecast models, um, growth rate forecasts, county spread forecasts, um, risk factors, this is a, a very excellent resource um, available. So, um, and they've done a really, really good job with this. I'll kind of touch on a few things here. I'm using this pest cast um, in particular uh, works very well. This is the prediction for May 5th, 2021, um, just kind of as, as an FYI. So they can just kind of see at this point, they're looking, up, it's a, they're looking at about half or so of um, a potential egg mass hatch in, in Virginia. So again, Virginia centric, but you can kind of zero in on your area. I am a little reluctant to use this when you're giving pres giving presentation to the general public because again, people sort of say, oh, wow, the things, spotted lanternflies over the entire country. No, this is just as far as it's, it's it, if it were there, this is the predicted stage it would be in. So if you're giving presentation to the general public, just kind of be a little careful about these kinds of maps um, and, and talk about this as prediction. This is not, not where it's at. So then this is, so again, this is, April, this is April 1st, not again, but this is April 1st, Virginia, that big red dot is the major infestation in Virginia around Winchester, um, but that just shows you a predicted egg, egg hatch for April 1st, which we would not expect to see it, but you can see it's kind of creeping up in there, and I'll, I'll touch on that here, here in just a minute too. Uh, then we jump ahead a month later, and now we're definitely getting the egg hatch, and this is then coincides with our field observations that the, this, this insect is, is hatching. So, uh, degree day sources. A lot of, there's a couple of really good sources. One, um, New York State IPM program um, has a uh, degree day uh, uh, model. Uh, I prefer to use the National Weather Service. It just seems a little easier for me as far as 
getting information um, that I like to use. But again, it's just kind of a preference. They're both good. And uh, so there, the National Weather Service, uh, you just go look at past weather, uh, pull up a map, do view map, and get your particular location. Then you go on the, the pull down list, pick out a particular city. Um, not all of them have full data, so you have to look kind of uh, do that. You then are clicking on accumulation graphs, and then your variable you grew growing degree day base 50, and then you do your start and end date. So it's a little, um, a little clunky, not real clunky, not really good. Word. It takes a little kind of a little finesse at first, but then um, then you, you definitely can get to it. So this is Winchester, just as a for instance, uh, growing degree day occurred about May 3rd um, in 2021, May 8th in 2020. And that coincides with the hatch data that we saw for it. This is Lynchburg. Um, that accumulation occurred uh, April 11th, 2021. So, and March 28th in 2020. So a bit earlier there, again, more of a, a not the most Southern location of Virginia, but this lower elevation, it's definitely Piedmont um, in Virginia, quite a bit warmer, quite a bit warmer earlier there at Lynchburg. Uh, so, and, but we haven't, the population is small enough in Lynchburg that we haven't been able to get some sort of essentially ground truth data on that. This is the accumulation for Withville. Now, Withville is the most, not really the most southern location, actually, our Hillsville is in Virginia, but it's higher elevation. So the growing degree to accumulation is a little bit slower there. I'll say, kind of coming back to this, um, uh, this dashboard again, again, an excellent resource. Uh, to, to use. This is the spread forecast. I, mean, I thought it was kind of interesting when you look at this here um, as a potential spread for it. So this is 2021 and that matches about what we're seeing in 2021. Um, this is predicted for 10 years from now, 2032. Um, like the gypsy moth, it seems to have stopped at the Virginia, North Carolina line. That's a joke. Um, but anyway, I don't Probably should get away from that joke um, and move on. This is as we would look at maybe uh, 23 years in the future, 2045. So um, again, this is just a spread forecast. Again, be careful using this in presentations um, because you'll say, oh, it's everywhere. No, it's this is 2045 predicted. So lots of things can happen between here and there, but this is kind of, I think is good for planning, um, particularly you know in the Midwest, um, just think about, what you're going to be doing down the road. Uh, this does not include human aided transport. So that is, um, I think is, is needs to be a factor and it's going to be something that's hard to predict. It's, spot lantern fly is very easy to detect once you get an eye for it, um, but it's also one that we kind of is always going to be potentially moved around. Uh, it's going to look like a particular location. Uh, and there's high risk areas and other areas that produced by a temple lab. This is a Virginia one. It's a very interesting one that the high risk areas that they, they indicate here on the map are just exactly um, right on. Uh, so the airports, uh, not so much, but the truck stops have been a very big factor. So you see this cluster of four here down by Withville, cluster of four up here by um, Harrisonburg, I um, mean by Stanton, cluster of three up by Harrisonburg. So, and all those have had um, and there have been detections in those counties. So trucks uh, seem to be a very good way to move spotted lanternfly, unfortunately. I-81 is a, is a major corridor through Virginia, particularly you know, a lot of trucking companies have switched to I-81, uh, they used to go by 95, um, and in the past 30 years, um, uh, that the amount of trucking on I-81 has, has grown exorbitantly, um, exponentially, uh, both. Um, it's, it's no longer a pleasant road to be on just because of the huge amount of truck traffic and thus the potential for moving invasives. Um, there's also uh, on there, I thought that was kind of interesting to um, host preference uh, map. Uh, so this is number of all plant species per county. Um, and I, just, I singled out Frederick County because that initial detection was made in Virginia. Number of known potential hosts for spotted lanternfly 123, and they have a weighted host preference for that too. So it's kind of, if you want to actually kind of delve down into your particular area, 
um, and to kind of look at the potential for these things. Uh, so this is um, uh, a good thing to kind of maybe take a look at. Again, this is potential spread to kind of make some planning, pre-planning for your, your area. Um, the maps, um, again, there's this, it's, it's not anything wrong with anybody who's preparing these maps at all. There's just a lag time between detection, reporting through the state regulatory office in Virginia, um, they get reported uh, and to the either to the um, Virginia um, Department of Agriculture and Consumer Services or through myself or through the Virginia Department of Forestry. Uh, and then they need to go to a USDA um, specialist for identification, even though we all know what it is. Um, and then once it's got officially confirmed, then it, it ends up on the map. So there's kind of a bit of a lag time there, I think, in your particular state. Um, it, it's always kind of good to talk to the entomologist at Land Grant University um, and kind of see where we know where it's at. Um, and just, but just be aware of there's these regulatory aspects because the quarantine insect, it, it can be a bit of a lag on that too. So the, the maps that I'm using for Virginia are, look a little different than the national maps, but that's not anything a slight on anybody, just kind of that's, that's where we're at. So this is um, as of June 10th, um, 2022, this is spotted lanternfly distribution in Virginia. And I already showed you this slide, but the virtually all of these detections are been made along highways or railroad corridors. Uh, so the, and so that again, human-aided transport, and that's gonna again, continue, continue to be a factor. So we already have Infested County that borders North Carolina. Um, so, you know, this is something that we kind of, and they definitely are, are aware of it too, but this is something to kind of think about, again, this human-aided transport is always a factor for this. Um, so if you're doing work as, a, as an arborist or moving trees or plant material in an infested area, um, you know, you, you definitely need to be aware of it. Um, definitely be doing inspections to make sure that you're not the one that's, that's moving out of a particular location. So, and uh, let's see where I've got. This is again, Virginia centric. We got a lot of information available um, on there. Um, if you just are Googling um, Spotted Lanterfly Virginia Tech or Spotted Lanterfly or Virginia Property Extension, we got a lot of fact sheets, information, best management too. Um, and also you get to some resources from the Virginia Department of Agriculture. I definitely wanna make a shout out to Pennsylvania. Um, they have just been incredibly exceptional, both from Penn State um, via Pennsylvania Cooperative Extension and the Pennsylvania Department of Agriculture um, have produced a huge amount of material um, and are just have been uh, very, very open and sharing, providing information too. So I'm sure a lot of you already have, have, have tapped into Pennsylvania sources um, and I highly recommend it. Uh, you know, it's, you know, you do want to go to your local state resources because again, the kind of nuance as far as this insect is where it's at, but um, these a lot of good information from Pennsylvania. And this is kind of the dashboard. This, I guess, so when people are looking at recording, they can pause this and take a look. But talk about the dashboard. Stop SLF is another excellent resources, uh, resource for that. Um, but again, there's a lot, of, a lot of people working on it, a lot of really good information. Um, and there's kind of one small little cog here um, and working on it here in Virginia and, and the like. But um, I don't want to, don't want to call out that. There's, there's always really good information. I know Rainbow Tree, I've looked at their information a little too. I'll post a lot of good stuff too. So, um, you know, by all means, you know, kind of keep an eye out for various sources for that. So um, this is like to finish up with this uh, picture I took. This is actually on a black wall in it. It was actually kind of interesting that this was the first tree we actually saw tree damage from spotted lanternfly um, in, in 2018. So, um, with that, that finishes up my slides, and um, I will uh, see. Do, do a stop share here? And yeah, I we can we can go back to it if need. But um, happy to take any questions. Or Eric, are you going to go through the, um, the question and answer, or, or should I look at that? Yeah, yeah, I'll go ahead and uh, read some of these through. Um, First off, thanks for your presentation. That was great. Uh, so first question we have is from Kyle. 
what types of evaluations have been done along railways to see if there's too much Alanthus? Well, there, I would probably, in Virginia, um, I know there's been some work with the Virginia Department of Forestry, Lori Chamberlain, Caitlin Moneyham, and that, that group, uh, Virginia, Virginia Department of Agriculture, um, Tina McIntyre has done some assessments, but I don't know, you know, just kind of the drive-by assessment that if you want to find tree of heaven, just drive along the highway or the railroad. Um, so I don't really have a good answer as far as assessment or inventory, but, um, and I would refer you on to the Virginia Park Forestry, particularly the publication on, well, on um, Atlantis uh, about that. But uh, yes, unfortunately, um, you know, rail, rail areas, disturbed soils have been a great place for tree of heaven to grow. Yeah. Okay. We have a question from Derek. Does English walnut nutritionally support the lanternfly to full development like black walnut as a single host? I don't know if I can specifically answer for English walnut, but I know black, black walnut though has been utilized and they can complete development um, from for nymph to adult um, on black walnut. So, and they also like it too. You do, that's a, one other place. It's pretty easy to find them, check on black walnut, but I can't nuance that. I would, I would say, I would look to say Behringer or, um, uh, or also to Kelly Hoover as far as some of their work on hosts and they, they may nuance out that English walnut um, issue. So, uh, but we've seen one English walnut, but I, I can't speak as far as how will they develop one yet. Sure. All right, next question we have from Jay. Do you suspect a correlation between the current concentration in Virginia and interstate travel routes from the areas of infestation in Pennsylvania and Maryland, like along a major highway or railway, for example? Yeah, I, I think that we definitely are seeing it. So um, a number of detections have been made at uh, rest areas and truck stops. And so this is, and particularly for us on rest areas and truck stops that are for southbound traffic. So, and they're often um, at truck stops, you have uh, Atlantis growing along the back edge of truck stops, the trucks are backing in, the backs of trailers are trucks touching Atlantis trees. So it's unfortunate that that scenario is there because that's also a very good way to see it. We've also seen too, the spread from Winchester along rail lines. So that's another place when you're looking just by Lanterfly, follow the rail lines, look for Clumphalanthus, and unfortunately they've been found along there too. So the detection in Lynchburg would be case in point. That's a rail line that goes through the town of the city of Lynchburg. And unfortunately they're all along, along there. Again, highly associated with, with the tree of heaven nearby to rail lines. So yes, I, the way I kind of answered it, but that's, again, we look for, you know, these transportation cores, particularly southbound, um, that's the place have been the best, unfortunately, the best places to find it. So it's, it, it's, it seems to, again, a very, as has been said many times by other people, it's a very good hitchhiker. Yeah. Okay. Ryan asks, are there egg deposits from beneficial insects that look similar to that of lanternfly eggs? Oh yeah, certainly there are. We, one of the the fact sheets you'll see available from Virginia Tech is egg mass lookalikes. Uh, so we get things um, sent in uh, to some extent, things like um, egg masses from Eastern tent caterpillar um, and wheel bugs look pretty similar. Uh, and so that's, those would be the lookalikes be sent in. We love to get lookalikes because that means that people have the right search image and they're, they're definitely looking and checking and seeing things. And so you're not, you would never annoy me by sending me a lookalike um, too. So if you think it looks any bit like it, there is a, a very rare um, plant hopper um, in the genus Plobica. Looks similar, it's solid black and it makes an egg mass. Very similar to fly lanternfly, but we don't only send a couple of those sent in. Um, but the, the egg masses, the main thing is kind of um, to kind of learn to see what the egg masses look like and get a, get a visual for that. So 
the best training um, is if you can go to a site that is heavily infested and um, you know, hey, if, uh, I, it's a field tour kind of thing. I'm always happy to be out of the lab and in the field. So um, probably sometime in October is a good time to go look for look at egg masses and, and um, there might be a meeting down the road to meet in an infested area and go looking for egg masses and that sort of thing too. But main thing is kind of learn how to look for the egg masses. Once you start to get a pretty good visual, then you're pretty good at identifying. Sure. Um, we have another one from Dan Gilrain. Uh, Eric, can you discuss tree damage further? What are you seeing? Uh, any mortality? And thanks, excellent presentation. Uh, so Virginia experienced different than other locations. So that I talked about a little bit about that black walnut where we saw severe yellowing. I, did, there, I have another shot that kind of showed from the distance. That's about the extent of the damage we're seeing in Virginia on, on, on Alanthus trees and on, on, on black walnut, that you will see yellowing um, and tree decline. We have not seen tree mortality. I hate to add this comma yet, um, but we haven't seen that there. Um, as far as detections on um, in fruit and vineyards, yes, they have been detected on in vineyards, um, and they are definitely being met with um, pesticides there uh, for control. Um, but so we haven't seen um, vineyard damage or vine mortality. Now I know they've seen in Pennsylvania vine mortality on grape. Um, but there's also other factors involved on those sites. And, and um, so I don't really feel qualified to, to answer that fully. But kind of circling back to Virginia, we haven't seen mortality, um, but certainly we've seen the level of damage and the level of, of honeydew produced in backyards, mean that these are huge nuisance pest quality of life issue in folks' backyards already. So we're definitely seeing that. Sure. All right, so we have a, another question from Negan. Why does the 2032 model have it jumping over much of Indiana to Chicago? Transportation corridors, question mark? Probably, I think um, that they do show it uh, spreading kind of on, a, on its own. So I, mean, I thought that that map kind of showed all the counties filled in by 2032 between Pennsylvania and Chicago is what the predicted is. But I would guess based on the Virginia experience, that will follow those major highways um, first. So, and, and it's obvious, that's obvious the way that they're looking for it too. I mean, that's all the surveys done by the various state departments of agriculture are definitely looking at all those transportation corridors. So I would think it would find it kind of first sort of look um, uh, spider webby at first, you know, the following these rail lines and uh, highways, but then a kind of an infill from the, the quote unquote natural spread of the spotted lanternfly once it's established on location. That would definitely um, fit what we saw for, for Virginia. So Virginia, we saw 2018, it showed up in Winchester um, at a site along a rail yard, although it probably was likely brought in by trucks, we don't know for sure. Um, and then from there, um, it's, did, we did get other indications of it along transportation corridors, but it spread from, uh, out into the into the surrounding county areas at this rate of this three to three to four miles a year. So that's it kind of spread from there. Uh, Ditto Shenandoah County showed up um, at a truck stop um, and then spreading from there into the area. So I, I definitely would think that the spread would be transportation corridors first and infill later. Sure. Um, and it looks like we have time for one more question. Um, so if, what kind of threats does spotted lanternfly present to ecological health of natural areas as opposed to agriculture and timber? Well, that, that, that's hard to say. Um, so it's that conundrum where you have invasive feeding on invasive. So the tree with the biggest impact right now seems to be a tree of heaven. Um, so in tree of heaven already is um, and they, you know, as, as we know, invasive. So I don't really know if I can answer that. I would say probably look into the work that Kelly Hoover or Lawrence Berenger is doing, um, Julie Urban too, uh, 
and see as far as it, the, the ecological impacts. But I think for me and my position here around the insectification lab and being an economic entomologist, I'm kind of been sort of focused in on the impact for, for producers. But uh, certainly, I, you know, there's a lot of the work as far as ecological impact from others. Uh, so I don't really feel quite qualified to answer that one, I guess, in a, in a long roundabout way to answer that. Sure. <laughs> Great. Well, um, it looks like there's a couple more questions in the Q&A, um, but just in the interest of time, we're just going to kind of move forward with this. Um, uh, and, Eric, go ahead, Eric if you can take time to answer, if you have a couple minutes to type any answers into the chat or the Q&A, that would be great. I would be happy to do that. I'll also paste in some links um, to like a Temple Lab and some other sources as far as information too. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll work on that um, while the next speaker is presenting. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for your presentation, Eric. It's always a pleasure. And uh, yeah, we'll move on to the next speaker. Thank you again. Thank you for having me.